right, everybody, and uh, welcome to Stamp Chat. I'm going to just allow everybody to file in for a few moments, and then we'll get started. We've got 90 minutes of good times coming ahead to celebrate National Library Week, and I cannot wait to get started with everybody. And I see we have a very healthy audience, so that's totally awesome. those numbers and it's three hours, but that's about it all right well hi everyone and welcome to stamp chat i'm heidi rhodes today's stamp chat recognizes and celebrates national library week we're discussing librarians libraries and the hobby we have a very special panel of librarians and an archivist some are collectors while others are not each however is affiliated with the hobby and a library they join us from across the USA and across the pond. They, they are Nicola Davies from the, the Librarian for the Royal Philatelic Society London. James Gate is the collector and the Librarian Emeritus of National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. Dr. Deborah Lee is a collector and librarian at Mississippi State. Dr. Richard Morrill is a collector and an archivist at the British Library. Scott Tiffany is the Director of Information Services for the American Philatelic Library. And Basil Wilder is a librarian with the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. He currently serves the National Postal Museum Library and the Anacostia Community Museum Library. Stamp Chat is a production of the American Philatelic Society. Since 1886, the APS has served collectors with the services and support they need, including access to the American Philatelic Research Library. The APRL is one of the largest philatelic libraries in the world with four miles of books and journals. The APRL is a premier destination for philatelic research. Visit stamps.org to become an APS member and learn more about the APRL. You can support the library's digitization efforts by contributing to the Adopt a Book campaign. Find out more, visit stamps.org. Well, thanks everyone. And thank you for joining me and our panel today and happy National Library Week. The theme of this year's National Library Week is welcome to your library. And in keeping with this week of celebration and recognition, the APS has been able to open the doors to the APRL on a limited appointment basis. Uh, but nevertheless, we're very excited to have members back inside the library. So thanks everyone. Thank you for joining me and friends that are uh, in the audience and on YouTube or Facebook, feel free to use the chat box. Um, for friends that are on the Zoom webinar, please use the Q&A to direct your questions to our panelists. Um, and so before we begin, uh, I'd like to give some time to each one of our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit more about the organizations that they represent. So we are going to go ahead and start with Basil Wilder, please. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yes. Hi, my name is Basso Wilder. I'm the third librarian in the history of the National Post Museum. The Smithsonian's National Post Museum Library is situated behind the scenes inside of the museum staff area. We have materials on postal history and flat sleep. We are the only Smithsonian Museum located inside of a post office. And we are strategically located across the street from Union Station in Washington, DC, the busiest passenger rail line in the nation. Our Adopt-a-Book program allows you to leave a legacy while providing funding which supports the library. When you adopt a book, you'll be acknowledged with a physical book plate and your selected item as seen in this photo. We are walking distance from the Library of Congress, the US Postal Service Headquarters Building, and the National Archives. 
Another amazing aspect of this library's location is the public museum gallery is only a few feet away and the high security collections vault with all the valuable stamps is right down the hall. It couldn't get any better than that. The library was established along with the museum in 1993 and it is one of 21 specialized libraries in the Smithsonian library system. A library system with 2 million volumes which are now part of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. At the Postal Museum Library, we have over 40,000 volumes devoted to the study of postal history and philately. This library collection was created with generous book and dirt journal donations of philatelists from around the world, including Frederick Melville, George Turner, and curators of the National Philatelic Collection. Our third and persistent postmaster general files include correspondence between the Postmaster General and citizens ranging from 1901 to 1974. We also have a government documents section in our library, which includes the annual reports of the Postmaster General, the Postal Bulletins, United States Official Postal Guides, and the Postal Laws and Regulations. We loan and borrow books from libraries worldwide. We also contribute to the Global Philatelic Library in the Philatelic Union Catalog. I enjoy sharing information with the talented librarians who are on this panel and library colleagues internationally. Whenever librarians collaborate, we offer philatelists and postal historians a wealth of information to enhance the research experience. The Postal Museum Library is open to researchers by appointment and we are also the only Smithsonian Library with Saturday hours once a month. After the pandemic, I'm hoping to offer the Saturday open house again. Currently, the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives are closed to staff and researchers because of the pandemic. However, we are still providing online services from home. Thank you. That was an excellent picture. It was fun to see everybody break out into a smile. Thank you, Basil, thank you. And next we have our own Scott Tiffany from the APRL. Hi, Scott. Hi, Heidi, thank you. Uh, to start sharing my screen. Uh, so my name is Scott Tiffany. I'm the director of, of library and information services and librarian here at the American Philatelic Research Library. Uh, we're located in Belfont, Pennsylvania. Uh, we were founded in 1889 when the collection was much smaller. It was a group of collectors who formed the association as it was then known, the American Philatelic Association, and they pooled their resources together. We were officially incorporated and renamed uh, the American Philatelic Research Library in 1968. Uh, the picture you see on the left here is of the new space that we have in the library, it's two floors. We have about 19,000 square feet of public repository and archive. This is a shot of the, the, the public space uh, of the library. On the first floor, we have the main book collection as well as uh, government documents. We have exhibits on the first floor, name sales. We even have a small collection of stamp albums. Uh, some of our members like to sort of see uh, old stamp albums as when they were young as collectors. Uh, we're a truly worldwide collection. Uh, we collect all countries of the world uh, with, for philately. Uh, we organize the collection by Library of Congress subject, uh, subject headings. Basically, we organize it by country first. And then within each country, we have the terms, bro the, the material broken out into philatelic material, philatelic uh, subtopics, if you will. Uh, we're open Monday to Friday. We have about 90,000 items, I should mention that. And a breakdown of that, we have about 34,000 book titles. We have about 8,800 8, auction titles, or I should say journal titles in the collection. Uh, of the books, uh, we try to collect uh, two of everything. Uh, the library is about 90% donated to us. We have a small budget to purchase material, but the majority of the collection is donated to us by members, by publishers, by authors, and just by individuals. 
Uh, in terms of auction houses, we have auction sales from about 1,600 different auction houses. Uh, and we have a small collection of about 1,000 philatelic exhibits that are in digital form. Um, in terms of the journals, as I said, we have about 8,800 8, titles. Of, I would say about 400 of those are still currently published that we receive in the library. Uh, we also have, this is the public space that you see here. We have a private space for our archival collections. We have about 500 different archival collections. Some of these are research collections. Some of these are just individual research items or items that we can't have in the public space. We also have a variety of miscellaneous uh, material that's in the archive area as well. Things like stamp posters, maps, uh, and other material like that that isn't sort of readily available in the public space. Uh, we have four full-time employees in the library. We have myself, we have a reference assistant, we have a library assistant, and we have a technical, uh, technical processing person who does all our cataloging. Uh, we kind of do a little bit of everything. It's sort of uh, everybody sort of contributes to other parts of the library. We all do reference requests as we receive them. We all do a little bit of cataloging. We all do a lot of different things in the library. Uh, we get on average about 200 reference requests to the library per month. Uh, we sort of parse those out as they come in. Some of the, the, the services that we provide, provide, we obviously have services for members and non-members. Worldwide, we, we can send out material uh, in terms of scans and photocopies worldwide. Only members of the APS can borrow materials from the library, and only those with North American addresses can, can we send those materials out to. We used to send out material for borrowing internationally, but we just found that just wasn't, didn't work for us. The postage was really kind of excessive, and uh, we just worried about things getting back to us in the mail. So now it's just North American addresses. We also provide uh, research services. So you can call us or email us, the numbers, uh, the information is there below. And uh, we can sort of answer your research requests. Uh, two of the, th the things that I wanna show you, one or two of which we're very proud of just recently have come into being. Uh, we have the David Strait, Basile mentioned a uh, new online catalog. This is the new platform for that. Uh, this we just rolled out in January of 2021. It's on a Genie Plus uh, platform, and uh, it allows us a lot of different sort of flexibility and sort of options that we didn't have in the previous online catalog. It has about 30, 386,000 bibliographic records. It includes not only the records for the APRL, but also eight other philatelic libraries, uh, some who are on this, this particular call right now. We also have an article index. We have volunteers throughout the country that sort of uh, index articles for us in all the major journals. Uh, we're always looking for more volunteers to do that, but currently they, we have about 222,000 citations to those uh, records uh, articles throughout uh, various journals. Uh, we also, with the new online catalog, we have some additional features that allow us to link to online resources. So if a particular document is available somewhere on the internet in full, full, form, full text digital form, uh, we have a link for that in the records as well as we have a sort of individual database, if you will, of just those resources. Uh, we also have new resources as they come into the library. If you look at the on the left at the top, there's a tab there for new resources. If you click on that, you can see the new resources that have been recently cataloged, not only at the APRL, but the other philatelic libraries as well in the catalog. Finally, we have a used inventory, uh, used books for sale tab at the top of the screen. And this is material that we get into the library. Sorry, I have a train going by my office. Um, uh, this is where you can click on that link. And these are materials that if we don't have a use for them in our collection, or if we don't uh, have, uh, we offer them to other philatelic libraries if nobody else uh, has need of them, that we sort of put them up for sale. And really that helps with our library services. Bottom of the screen is the link for this new online catalog. But if you go to the APS website and click into the library webpage, you'll find a link there for it too, as well as uh, tutorials for searching the catalog. The other thing I want to talk about a little bit is about our digital collections database. This is a project that we started about two years ago now. Uh, we're starting to really grow this. Uh, this is a digital library where we have about 620,000 full text searchable pages 
in the in the database. Uh, it allows you all the same features that you would in sort of any digital collection. You can display, print, uh, download sort of items from the database. Uh, we have nine complete journal runs as well as a few other items in the database. But what's really exciting, uh, I've been working on uh, trying to receive permissions from other uh, public from other societies, clubs, organizations, philatelic organizations to have their journals in the database. And we've received, I just received my 44th one the other day. So we have 44 journals that we've received permissions for. Uh, we have about 200 exhibits now and about eight books that we've received permissions for. And so we're really excited about this. This is something that's going to be growing over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, and we're really sort of um, we just recently renamed it uh, the Robert A. Mason Digital Library in honor of uh, someone who is going to be supporting this uh, in a very sort of uh, incredible way uh, in terms of re uh, allowing us to do the kind of digitization that we're looking forward to. So that's really all I, um, I want to say. And I'll, with that, I'll pass it back to Heidi. Thank you, Scott. And again, it's been so fun to see visitors coming back into the building. Um, just a little footnote, you, it, it is a very limited basis, so um, you'll need to make a reservation. Next librarian, or in this case, archivist, is Dr. Richard Morrill from the British Library. Welcome. Hello there, everyone. Um, I'll just put my screen up. So... Um, as, as Heidi correctly points out, let me begin with a confession. I'm a fraud. I'm a qualified archivist and records manager, not a librarian. Nevertheless, there are incredibly strong synergies and professional methodologies between the, the, these um, roles. And within the UK's professional sector, um, the boundaries between them are becoming increasingly blurred. You could say that my professional career working within libraries and archives uh, began almost from the cradle and one hopes it will continue to the grave because I really love what I do. So um, despite being a rather boisterous, bellicose young, young child, I was always very passionate about learning, research, and spent lots of time in my local and school libraries. And, and, and actually my, my, my career as such began way back in secondary school when I was about 12 year old, working as a library monitor in, in my lunch break, um, you know, helping kids find books, reshelving stuff and helping the librarian. But actually, uh, I got more serious into it um, while I was at university doing my various degrees, um, working part time as a, a library assistant in the University of London Library and Special Collections at Senate House. And then moving on from there to the School of Oriental and African Studies Library and Special Collections, where one of my favourite jobs was actually um, helping move a, a collection of Burmese palm leaf manuscripts to new storage in the building. After graduating my final degree and being a newly qualified archivist, um, I had a brief spell working in Finsbury Library and the Islington Local History Centre, so a public library kind of background, where I was working on a range of collection management roles and, and interestingly once found a mummified arm in, in the collection. Uh, from there, I went on to move back into the kind of archives role, working as a, an archives assistant at St James's Palace uh, for the Prince of Wales. That's probably going to raise some eyebrows given the Oprah Winfrey interview recently, but um, I did what I did. Uh, and there I was involved in helping uh, prepare a move for the Prince of Wales's archives and semi-current records from his um, old accommodation in St James's Palace into Clarence House proper. And then in 2004 was appointed the archivist for the India office records at the British Library. I was in that role for about a decade. And then seven years ago this month, I transferred across uh, to be the one of the curators of the British Library's philatelic collections. Um, so uh, the British Library is one of the, the largest libraries in the world, and it's the it's the National Library of the United Kingdom. And it, it's quite a recent institution actually it was established by an act of parliament in 1973 merging several major research libraries together including the british museums library which we were a part and, and you can see here the picture of the round reading room at the british museums library we often get tourists coming going hey where did Karl Marx write the communist manifesto and they look really disappointed when we have to point that they're, they're in the wrong building 
Um, as a legal deposit library, we're entitled to receive one free copy of every item published and, or distributed within the United Kingdom. And our current overall annual budget currently stands at about £142 million. Small wonder, small wonder that we acquire around 3 million new collection items as an institution each year, occupying about 9.6 kilometres of new shelf space. Um, the British Library's philatelic collections were actually established uh, within the Department of Printed Books at the British Museum Library in 1891, following the bequest of Thomas Key Taplin's near complete collection of worldwide postage stamps, telegraph stamps and postal stations that was issued between 1840 and, and 1890. And, for the benefit of the of, of our of our American friends, I've put up a, a few of the rarities that one would expect. Well, quite a lot, a small fraction of what you would expect to find in our, in our kind of U.S. holdings, um, containing you know many of the world's first and successive classical stamp issues, in addition to associated essays, proof material, shades, errors, and varieties. Uh, the collection is flatically significant on on a global level, though. Over the years, our holdings have continually expanded via successive donations, bequests and transfers of official archives. We've never purchased a collection. And that says a lot about the largesse of the philatelic community, I think. Uh, but to date, the, the British Library's philatelic collections currently comprise over 70 collections of international significance. They total around eight and a half million collection items. Um, Notable uh, material within this archive includes kind of the Board of Inland Revenue Stamping Department archive, of which we've got the registration sheet for the America 1765 revenue stamps. Uh, the the Board of uh, the Crown Agents Philatelic and Security Printing Archive and the Fitzgerald Collection of World Airmails to 1930, which includes a, a, a single uh, USA 1918 inverted Jenny. Uh, the philatelic collections moved from the British Museum across to their current location in 1997 and situated on the upper ground floor of the British Library of St Pancras building is a, a, a 10 grade one listed kind of philatelic display cases totaling over a thousand frames which permit us to display several thousand philatelic items at any one time um, and in effect these cases constitute the British Library's largest permanent exhibition space. Uh, we don't just have stamps and uh, postal history material, we also have objects. Uh, so, for example, next to the cases, you'll find the Perkins D cylinder printing press, which was used to print the Penny Blacks and early colonial stamps. Uh, we also have a dedicated kind of reading room uh, shown here with me and my, my boss, the lead curator, Paul Skinner. Uh, at work and anybody can book an appointment to conduct philatelic research on a first come first serve basis um, between mon Monday to Friday between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. In addition to the philatelic collections, the British Library as a whole also has a large body of philatelic literature from around the world um, and it's estimated to comprise about 35,000 volumes, and, and some of these you can access directly via the various reading rooms, not just the philatelic collections. One notable collection in the library includes the philatelic library of the 26th Earl of Crawford, which was bequeathed to the British Museum Library in 1913. And it's probably the most complete collection of philatelic literature covering the period from 1861 to 1913. And it covers around four and a half thousand volumes. Only two staff manage the entire front and back of house operations of the British Library's philatelic collections. Therefore, teamwork within the library and along with other institutions is of fundamental importance to maximise what we can all deliver. Um, in 2016, with funding from the British Philatelic Trust and the British Library's philatelic, uh, the, sorry, the British Library's philatelic collections managed the digitisation of over 600,000 out of copyright texts from the um, microfilm of the Crawford Philatelic Library. And working alongside Nicola and colleagues at the Royal Philatelic Society London, as well as the Global Philatelic Library, these images are now freely available online for research around the world. And such collaborative enterprise not only makes London a global centre for philatelic research. You know, we have the library, the Royal Philatelic Society and the Postal Museum within walking distance of each other. Um, this kind of work also benefits the kind of global philatelic community as a whole. Anybody interested in learning more about our holdings and resources or wishes to contact us can find some of the relevant information here. So my predecessor, David Beach, has done a really useful guide on the collections uh, held in the 
uh, philatelic collections, uh, as well as a, a good, uh, a very important article on the digitization project to the philatelic library. Um, with regards to the British Library's overall digital holdings of philatelic significance, I'd, I'd point you out to my recent um, article in the latest edition of the Philatelic Literature Review. Uh, and anyone interested in the Crown Agents Archive could look at last year's um, edition of the London Flat List. Um, you could look online uh, for books on the book and a manuscript catalogue via the, the British Library catalogue link. And of course, you could always email me or the department directly for any inquiries. We're there to facilitate research rather than conduct it on your behalf, though. And finally, if you're interested in some of the day to day kind of interesting things we find or activities, you could always follow us on Twitter. I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. That was beautiful. And I'm really enjoying how we can go around the globe on, from library to library. How fun. Our next presenter or uh, our next intro, you know, on our passport through uh, philatelic libraries is Dr. Deborah Lee, which is not a philatelic library. However, Deborah, Dr. Lee is a collector and she was featured on our uh, stamp story. So welcome, Dr. Lee. Thank you. I did warn folks that, that I'm going to be a little different than everybody else because we're not a philatelic library. I'm the Associate Dean and Professor at Mississippi State University Library, and we are a, a Research One uh, agricultural and land grant institution. And like a lot of academic libraries, we reflect the community that we, we serve. But there are a lot of philatetic materials kind of hidden into the, this, this broader collection. And I think we're like a lot of academic libraries and a lot of large public libraries and even historical societies where you may find that you have this real resource in your backyard that didn't necessarily advertise as a philatetic collection, but has a lot of material that you could access. So I wanted to share with you my journey through our collections. I, I've worked at Mississippi State 28 years this month. Uh, so I've been there a long time. I've been a collector even longer than that. But I, to be honest, I had never taken my collector's hat into the library before. And so I really looked at our collections and how we access materials a little differently. And I thought I'd take you along with that. Two things, I am not an expert in anything I'm about to show you. So I'm just gonna say that up front. I found some really cool things, but uh, I, it's gonna take a great deal more research for me to understand the background behind them. And on the last slide, I do have the URLs for every resource that I'm gonna talk about. So either in this session or in the recording, you've got access to that material and you can uh, always follow up if you're interested. I started with the TH, um, I can't read that there because it's in John Smith. There we go. The T.H. Smith Postal History Collection. And I started by looking online at some of our digitized collections. And again, because we are a research library, we are not a philatetic library, I had to be a little creative in how I looked for information. And I found this wonderful digitized collection of postcards that I could start to look at. And as I looked at these postcards, I could tell that they were depicting different scenes from Mississippi. This is from Brookhaven, Mississippi. Um, the T.H. Smith Postal History Collection actually is a historical collection for postal history, but the person who curated it was not a collector. And so when I look at the metadata that describes this particular card, and again, metadata is just that, that information about an artifact. So collectors, we, we collect metadata, we develop metadata for our collections, right? If you've got something that you've identified the, the Scott number and the, the condition, what it, its relationship to a set, its context, you've developed metadata yourself for your collection. But metadata is a really crucial aspect of getting access to archival materials. It's kind of the doorway that you can use to go into it. And so when I looked at this, I found some interesting metadata that told me it was from Brookhaven, Mississippi. It depicted a railway scene. It gave me physical dimensions. It told me the card was from 2007. And somebody even went in, and I was really impressed with this, and had uh, transcribed the message on the card. And so there's writing on both the front and the back of the card, and they had, had transcribed that. But what I didn't find is what I suspect the collector was after when he added this to his collection. Because for that, you have to flip the card. 
And when you flip this card over, you find out it's an RPO. And that's a special piece of, of material or um, railway. It's a particular type of postage or, or mailing that goes through the railway system. And so it has a very distinctive cancellation with those, those killer bars and the HMS in the middle. And it has a very distinctive postmark that will identify the railway line that takes that it went through. So this was the Memphis, Grenada, New Orleans line. And I'm sure that's the element that drew this collector to this material, but it's not included in the metadata anywhere about this card. And so if I, as a collector came to this collection and said, I wanna find all the RPOs in this collection, I couldn't look, I couldn't just do a search and find it. I would really have to dig and look at the card, which there's nothing wrong with that. Ever, this is completely online, anybody can access it, um, but you would have to bring your knowledge as a, a philatelist to the collection to be able to understand that. While we're not a, a museum, we do have museums in the library. And in fact, Mississippi State is the, um, the home of the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library. That's a whole nother story about how Grant ends up in Mississippi. But um, we are one of six institutions across the US that has a presidential library in, in the library system. And we've gotta be one of the few that has a 19th century canon on the fourth floor. Uh, so that it's a wonderful collection that includes a lot of primary materials, but there's some philatelic, philatelic material there as well. And then we're also the home of the Frank and Virginia Williams collection of Lincolniana. It's a companion gallery. Um, Judge Williams is a retired uh, chief justice from uh, Rhode Island. And he also is a lifelong collector of Lincoln materials. And so this is a phenomenal collection that has papers and, and documents and artifacts and furniture and arc and architecture, I mean, and, and, and sculpture. And when I went to look at some of the things that were associated with these, these collections, I went and talked to the people who curate them. So for the Grant Library, for example, some of that material is available online. And they told me that if the letter, if there's letters, if there's an envelope, they keep the envelope with the letters. That has not always been the case in archival work, but they for this collection, they did do that. And if it's available, they digitized it. So this is a, from the, a particular um, subset of the grant collection. Again, it's digitized, it's online. And I had to kind of look through the letters to find a good example. Um, this particular private was very, um, he wrote a lot. And so he had um, a, a letter that, that is very typical of Civil War um, mailings that I've seen. And so you can actually pull this up and view this online. You certainly could view, uh, visit the library and, and look at those materials as well. In the Lincoln collection, I actually contacted them and set up an appointment and told them what I was interested in looking at. And so when I came into the Lincoln collection in my appointed time, they had that stuff already pulled for me. It was waiting for me at the table. And it, it reflects the very much the character of the person who donated this collection because the focus was on Lincoln. It wasn't on philately. And so there are boxes and boxes of material. It's a very eclectic mix of really classic older material and very contemporary material. And so I found wonderful um, sheets of stamps. I found all kinds of, of specialized material. There was a, a, a good representation of international material that depicts Lincoln. And then there were all these postcards that reflects the challenge that you have when you're accessing this kind of a collection because the person who, who donated this material, who collected it, his focus was on Lincoln. And so when you look at the subject headings for the cards, it's related to the, the card and Lincoln and whatever Lincoln is doing on the card. So you have contemporary materials and really vintage materials mixed together. You have used and, and um, unused materials mixed together. So it's really up to me as the collector to come in and identify how this is going to collect and, and, and match to this. I really got interested in the T.H. Smith Postal History Collection. So I did a little bit more with that. I set up an appointment with the, um, the coordinator of our special collections, Jennifer McGillan. And she, uh, so when I came up for my session, she already had material pulled for me. I could just start, I could I make good use of my time. And she's the one that told me, oh, 
In addition to the 341 um, postcards that are digitized online, there are thousands and thousands of pieces to this collection. So the postcards that are digitized are in box one. There are 16 more boxes of material related to this one collection. And it's all about postal history. A lot of it focused on Mississippi. And I have fallen in love with this collection. This is my summer research project, I will tell you. And just looking through it, I found a really rich mixture of types of materials, of types of postmarks. Um, obviously, this is somebody who invested a great deal of time and resources into building this collection. And it's been inventoried, but there's really not been anything else done with it. And when I looked through it and I found some kind of cool things that I thought I might wanna follow up on, I found a lot of those postcards that were um, really commercial cards that had been put out by a particular, um, uh, uh, I think they were inserts in a magazine actually. And they are being mailed back to a poultry concern in Louisiana back in the 1800s. And they are from Mississippi farmers throughout the state. And they represent really small postal areas in the state. Um, and so this was Hermanville. I had to look up Hermanville. I live in Mississippi, but I, it's, it's a crossroads now. Um, and so it's an unincorporated area. And there are a lot of these really small areas represented. And, and it gives you a very nice picture of what, um, of, of what that, the postal system looked like at that time. The one on the left also caught my eye. And this is just from a very fast perusal of the box. And this is from the last day of mailing from that post office. It's being posted from A&M College. That's actually the precursor of Mississippi State. That's what we used to be called a long time ago. Um, and so it's signed by the Postmaster General. Obviously the post system went away. We have it back now. We do have a post office on campus. Um, and so that particular um, piece has me intrigued to find out more history about it. But again, if I came to the, the collection and said, I want to look at things that are postmarked from Mississippi State, or I want to look at things that are RPOs in this collection, the, the archivist probably would not be able to help me a great deal. They know a lot about the collection, but they are not philatelists and they don't know that aspect of the collection. I have found, however, that a lot of times archivists know information about collections that do not appear in the metadata. So you really want to connect with that person. There are some ways that I made this a success for me. I, I think I, I approached this, and I think these are approaches that would work with any academic library, any public library, that maybe is not a philatetic collection, but that you're interested in finding out more information that might be available through their collections. The first is to plan ahead. You know, Do your research online, find out what kind of collection strengths they have. Do they align with some aspect of your collecting interest? Contact the library before you show up, because in every case, I was able to just walk in and have the things waiting for me on the table and make the best use of my time. And again, we've been open since August to the public, so our collections are open, but these are very small reading rooms, very small spaces, so they aren't allowing but so many people to inhabit them at one time. So you really do have to make an appointment ahead of time. Archives and libraries have rules, and especially in these specialized spaces, they don't want you to bring a pen. Um, they're gonna, they are, are, many of them will not allow you to bring in a bag. So you're gonna have to post the, or put that stuff in a locker. Um, so you wanna know what those rules are ahead of time and then be prepared to explore because it's not like ordering takeout through McDonald's. You're gonna have to really spend some time getting to know the, those boxes and figuring out how did they, how did somebody divide that collection up? What was the, the rationale behind it? Does it fit with what you're looking for? Are you gonna have to think outside the box, literally, in terms of finding materials? And so all of these resources, um, many of them have things that are available online. We have digitized a tremendous amount of material as have a lot of university and academic libraries. And so you can find a phenomenal amount of material online. But what I found in doing this process is that whatever I find online is just the tip of the iceberg. And that there's a lot of information from I can get access to if I visit the, the, the 
the service itself, if I visit the collection and ask for additional information, I can find a lot more. But it is, um, we would welcome anybody, if you can find Starkville, we would absolutely welcome you to come here and um, would be glad to uh, introduce you to our collections. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I just wanted to let you know that uh, and we'll be talking about this uh, momentarily, friends, but we, we had a commenter that says, uh, excellent point about the metadata. As an archaeologist, I've seen that with curated artifact descriptions. So thanks a lot. And coming down the stretch, we've got Mr. Jim Gates with the, uh, the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Welcome. Thank you, Heidi. Um, it's great to be here with everybody today. And let me Hopefully, I will get this right. You're good. All right. Well, um, I've been collecting stamps since the mid 1960s um, and I continue to this day. But for the past 40 years, I've worked as a professional librarian. Um, I spent the first 15 years at university libraries. And then for the last 25, I was library director at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. Now, um, if you've ever had a chance to go to the Hall of Fame, you know that it is in the middle of no place. Cooperstown is a small village in upstate New York. Nobody goes there by mistake. Uh, you've got to be looking for it in order to find it. Uh, and if you wonder why I retired and moved to Florida at the end of my career, well, the four seasons of upstate New York are early winter, midwinter, late winter, and 4th of July. Um, and I don't miss having to shovel snow until, um, you know, sometime in May. Let me tell you, it's, it's a lot nicer down here after all those years shoveling snow. But the museum itself is located right on Main Street in the middle of the village. It opened in 1939. It's this beautiful old brick structure. It just fits in with the rest of the village. Uh, it hosts about 300,000 visitors a year, um, which is pretty remarkable when you consider that the population of Cooperstown is about 2,000. So um, it's a dramatic impact on the local economy. Well, located behind the main museum is the National Baseball Library. And the collection here uh, consists of over 3 million publications, documents, photographs, recordings, and just about anything you can think of that's related to baseball and uh, how it fits and impacts on American history and culture. In fact, uh, the museum is, you know, those who work there, we don't consider it uh, a baseball museum, we consider it an American history museum because uh, you can't really tell American history without including baseball in some capacity. Well, as part of that collection, uh, there's always been a small stamp collection. And then when I came to work there, it was one of my passions. And so I did everything I could to expand it. Uh, obviously, you would want to have a sampling of all the uh, United States postage stamps that cover baseball. And to the extent that there's a nice collection, um, its value as a research collection isn't anywhere near what Richard or Scott or Basil have in their facilities. Um, there, there's some really solid research material here, but one of the important reasons for collecting this material is to have it available for the curators to use in the various exhibits which they put together. Uh, in addition to the US stamps, there's a very nice collection of uh, worldwide or international stamps. And this would include countries that play baseball and uh, a surprising number of countries that don't play baseball have produced uh, baseball stamps uh, mostly to sell to the US Canadian collectors market. And they never even see their home country, uh, but they're somewhat popular among baseball collectors. Now, the core of the collection began on June 12, 1939. That's the day the museum opened. Directly across the street from the museum is the Cooperstown Post Office. And on that day, here you see on the left is Postmaster General James Farley. And on the right is the Commissioner of Baseball, Kennesaw Mountain Landis. And uh, he is purchasing from the um, Postmaster General, the first sheet of the Scott 855 Centennial of Baseball stamps. And you can see across the top of that sheet, there is some handwriting, and that's basically uh, Postmaster Farley writing down what that was. Well, uh, just 
Landis walked across the street, donated it to the museum where it still exists to this day. It is the first philatelic item in the collection and one of the very first things in the library collection. I used it uh, several times for various exhibits, uh, but this is housed in a climate controlled uh, storage area most of the time. Uh, in addition to this first sheet of stamps, there are a variety of first day covers uh, and other related things. I think we've identified almost 150 different caches from the first day of the Cooperstown um, first day of issue. Uh, in addition to this, there are first day covers from as many different baseball stamps as I could get my hands on. Um, like Scott, there's a, an extremely limited budget to buy material and at the Hall of Fame library, it's mostly new books for reference purposes. Uh, everything else is donated and I would spend at least a third of my time um, cultivating donors in order to acquire things. Or with respect to philatelic issues, I would acquire them myself and then turn around and donate them to the collection. The museum creates some of its own um, caches. Uh, this is from 2002. This is for the induction of Ozzy Smith. Uh, you can see the postal cancellation there. Uh, every year for the induction weekend, the post office opens up uh, some tents out in the parking lot and they do special cancellations the entire weekend. Uh, and there are people who specialize in just collecting the covers that were produced by the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, and then among the items that I love the most are these um, letters or packages we would get in the mail where a baseball fan would create their own art on the cover. Um, you know, there's nothing really special about the stamps here. It's the Purple Heart stamp. But uh, if you look at the, the person who sent this in to the research department, uh, they went through a lot of trouble to support the candidacy of Joe Jackson, who of course is banned from the Hall of Fame for his involvement in gambling. But there are a hardcore number of people who want to see him get inducted. And so we would receive this type of cover. Uh, and how can you not collect these things? I mean, they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, and believe it or not, we uh, quite a few of them come from prisoners who are sending letters to the research department to get information on a ball player. And of course, prisoners have all the time in the world. So they decorate their covers and send them in. Uh, and they were favorite items uh, to keep as well. Uh, there have been a few baseball cards that uh, included images of postage stamps. Uh, this one particular set, I think, has five different cards in it, each with a different stamp uh, on a different player. Um, and so this is kind of a crossover. There are uh, approximately 200,000 baseball cards in the collection. Uh, so this can be considered either part of the philatelic or part of the baseball card collection. And then there are non postage stamps that have been created by the collector's uh, market. Um, you know, part of the baseball card world is basically card collectors go after these things, although they are stamps. And I tried to get as many of these included in the philatelic collection as well. Uh, there have been a very few books about baseball and postage stamps. Here are the two most common. Um, we had several copies of these in the library collection and I have copies in my own personal collection. And I think one of my retirement projects is to do an updated book on the history of baseball and postage stamps from around the world. And then of course, there are quite a few issues of various magazines that talk about baseball and postage stamps. This is the American Philatelist from last June, which of course I have in my own collection, but uh, made sure that there was one in the Hall of Fame collection. But overall, it was a great job, um, you know, spent 25 years doing baseball stuff and getting paid for it. I mean, how cool is that? But from the standpoint of the philatelic collection, I actually got some of the, the staff excited about it. They had never collected stamps, but they would get a letter from somewhere, say Cuba or Panama, and they'd come running in and go, Jim, take a look at the stamp. Is it important? Is it any good? Um, and so I got them interested. I think I'm still the only one who collected stamps but at least they're paying attention to it now. Uh, as far as using the Baseball Hall of Fame library, it is open to the public uh, Monday through Friday, nine to five in these days of COVID. However, you do need to call in advance and make an appointment, which is what you would wanna do anyways, because you wanna let the reference staff know what you're coming to do, um, coming to investigate and they will have stuff pulled and waiting for you 
like most museum libraries, it is a closed collection. You cannot go down and pull your own stuff off the shelf. We have to do that for you. Uh, but the, the staff that I left behind, they love working with the public. They love helping researchers. And if you do have any questions related to baseball and philately, they certainly would be happy to help you. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. What a what a treat! To, I did not know that the AP was part of the uh, the collection there at the Hall of Fame. That is very cool. Very cool. And finally, thank you for your patience. We have Nicola Davies from the Royal Philatelic Society, London. Thanks for joining us. Just share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yes, that's um, good. Well, good evening from London. Um, I'm Nicola Davis. I'm the head of collections at the Royal Philatelic Society. Um, I'm, I suppose, relatively new to libraries. Really. I've only been working in them for about 10 years. Um, and before that, I worked in, uh, in law. Um, I am a collector of, I've got a thematic collection, a, a dog collection, because um, when I first started at the Royal, our, um, one of our volunteers, Maurice, said, oh, so do you collect stamps? And I said, well, I've got a few dog ones. And he said, oh, great. And then he went and told everybody that I collected dog stamps. So now I've got quite a, quite a good collection of them. Um, before coming to the Royal, which is about five years ago, I worked in um, in public libraries in northwest of England, um, and I originally came down to the Royal um, for a one year maternity cover contract. But as I said, that was um, that was five years ago. Um, for those of you who don't know the Royal, um, we founded in eighteen sixty nine. Um, we've got a membership of about two and a half thousand um, and more international than UK members, which um, a lot of people are surprised by. Um, we're based in the city of London. Um, for those of you who know London, just by um, Bank Station and you can see our, see our flag flying. Um, we're a registered charity and um, our museum is Arts Council accredited. And there are three members, uh, full-time staff. There's myself and there's um, a collection, two collections assistant. One primarily works in the library, the other with the archives and museum collections, but we, we all tend to do everything. Um, and we're supported by a team of volunteers who, um, without which, you know, their, their detailed knowledge of the subject and we have, you know, volunteers who specialise in some on, on the book collections, some on the auction catalogues, stamp catalogues, um, exhibition material. Um, so I think it really helps to have that combination of the professional expertise and the philatelic expertise. And I think it, you know, when it's those things are working together is, is when we when we do our, our best work. Um, our, just briefly, our collection, some of the figures now are a bit out of date because we're quite a large donation um, just before lockdown um, from the National Philatelic Society's library. Um, uh, that came to us and, um, and a few other societies um, as well have recently donated their, their libraries. So when I went into, um, into the library this week for the first time in, uh, in quite some time, uh, there are piles, there are boxes everywhere. So, um, but the last official count was um, about 25,000 um, books. Unlike Scott, we haven't got the room to have um, more than one copy of anything. <laughs> um, so it's uh, strictly one copy, unless there's, you know, the two copies have, uh, you know, special provenance or but it, it's unusual for us to keep more than one copy, but we do keep um, superseded editions of things. Um, so we, we very rarely, once something's in the collection, it very rarely leaves it. Um, again, like, um, like Scott, the vast majority of our collection is donations and always has been. We do have a small budget, um, which we tend to use for things um, 
that we wouldn't, you know, that are no longer in publication, that wouldn't come up very often, and, and that's what we would use that for. But the um, vast majority is um, donations. Um, our journals collection um, is probably one of the things that we've done the most work on um, in recent years. Um, we've got um, a volunteer, Jonathan, who um, puts in two or three days a week and has really um, focused on the historic journal runs and finding missing, um, you know, missing issues. I mean, we're very, uh, we're fortunate. We had a donation from the Spellman um, a few months ago, and I was working through that today, and that's filled in quite a few of our gaps. And um, currently, our first floor meeting room, one of the well, there aren't many upsides uh, for the COVID situation, but one for me is I've been able to use the big meeting room to spread out all the all the journal donations that have come in to to work out the runs to send them off for binding. Um, I mean, one of our biggest expenses, I'd say, um, from the collections point of view, is uh, you know the money we spend binding all our journals. Um, you know, so so they do, you know, stand the test of time. Auction catalogues. Um, we've volunteered John Ray. He's um, he's been working from home um, during uh, during COVID. I guess he hasn't been able to come in, but he's been going through researching and and putting all the data in, which has been a great help for us because when we've got the new catalogues in, we can just turn the zero to a one and um, and all the all the data is already in. So so our volunteers have found ways to help us um, remotely, which has um, you know, meant that the work hasn't come to a standstill. And we've got about 24,000 um, 24, auction catalogues, um, like the books and journals, this isn't just GB um, or Commonwealth, you know, we do collect worldwide and not just in English language. Um, this was the our old home in 41 Devonshire Place. Um, so we moved there, well, 1925, um, and we out, outgrew it quite some time ago. And um, that was a photograph not long before we left. And as you can see, um, not ideal that the tea and coffee facilities are in the same room as <laughs> the uh, the library. Um, and the, as much as uh, we were fond of the building and we had been there a long time, it wasn't fit for purpose. And the um, the local authority um, weren't uh, very helpful when it came to, you know, permission to um, do things to the building because it was listed. Uh, so we, we really had no option but to move. Um, I mean, it's... Like I say, we did, you know, we were very fond of the building, but it wasn't suitable, not just for the collections, access was a problem. Um, so, I, you know, it wasn't a great experience for researchers or staff. Um, so in 2000, well, 2019 was our uh, official opening Mother Queen. We moved to Abchurch Lane um, and we were so lucky to find this building um because you know we were never going to find something that met all our needs but i think it's as close as we could have come the library is um well the collections are kept over the two basements um the library space you see there which has no tea and coffee allowed in it anymore um that's on the um upper the upper basement floor or the lower ground which however you like to look at it um and the it now has dedicated research space and individual areas as well. Um, we have a store which is in the lower basement, environmentally and controlled, um, so climate, humidity, secure. So you know now for the first time, you know, the collections do have a you know a really a really suitable home. There's a dedicated research space now as well, secure research room, the book scanner as well. 
which has meant for the first time the collections can be looked at together. So the library archive collections, we have um, a team of uh, volunteer curators who look after the philatelic collections as well, so that they can all be reviewed together. Um, although I am a professional librarian, my role as uh, head of collections does mean that I uh, also have to turn my hand to looking after the museum and the archive collections, which um, include obviously the Royals history, but also Philatelic and security printed. So we've been doing a lot of work digitising um, the Perkins Bacon archives. Um, so our focus of the last year or so, because we haven't been able to go and play with our, our new building, has been um, getting as much stuff out there and um, we're fortunate that the Art Society, which are a voluntary society over in, in the UK, um, agreed to come and help. So they've been, you know, they've been doing some transcriptions for us and getting the material out to a wider audience. So not just, um, you know, not just philatelists, but people have been able to come and see that this material that traditionally is just uh, being looked at by philatelists and from a philatelic point of view um, can have you know real value for social history research economic history and um, banknotes um, banknote specialists so there's a, a whole you know family history as well um, we've found lots of you know lots of interesting things in and it's come around full circle that we've found things in there that have um, enriched our knowledge about our own history and philatelic history. So it's um, it's been really worthwhile. And, you know, we are passionate about getting as much stuff as we can to, you know, the, a wider a wider audience and to our international members and people who can't make it into London. Um, we are open from Monday for remote inquiries. I mean, as far as we've been able to working from home the last uh, year, uh, we've been dealing with um, inquiries where we've had access to the material. We do we do postal loans um, similar to the APRL, um, whereas we, we only offer them if you, you're resident within the UK. Um, and to members, but we will deal with um, scans and remote inquiries worldwide, and you don't have to be a uh, you don't have to be a member. Um, if you do have any inquiries, um, feel free to email me or or have have a look at our catalogue um, for a better idea of uh, what's available. We're hoping to be open for visits from the. 21st of June um, so fingers crossed for that um because we do feel like we haven't really settled into our our new building yet um so that's it from me thank you Nicola thank you and friends if you're welcome to stamp chat we are celebrating National Library Week we have Nicola Davis from the uh, Royal Philatelic Society London, Jim Gates from the National Baseball Hall of Fame, Dr. Deborah Lee from Mississippi State, Dr. Richard Morrill from the British Library, Basil Wilder from the National Postal Museum, and of course our own Scott Tiffany from the APRL. We have, a, we have about uh, 25 minutes, friends. Um, you can feel free on Facebook and YouTube to use the chat box if you've got questions and our friends here on the webinar use the Q&A. We're going to discuss, uh, as time permits, the role of the librarian, the role of the patron, and uh, how to prepare for your trip. If there's any extra time, then we'll talk about some cataloging and research. So um, when we were planning for this discussion, we did talk about um, you know, that how important it was to kind of go over what the role of the librarian is. So who wants to kick that off? Which librarian? Who? I can go Come ahead. And oh, okay. There we go. I was yeah. going to call on you, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, basically, the role of the librarian, I guide your research, I facilitate the research experience, help people find information and use it efficiently, I make library materials easy to find. I search for, acquire, and provide information, show people how to find and evaluate information, and make sure that information or is organized properly. And I provide excellent customer service. 
in Basel. That's that's good to know. I, th I think what's oh. interesting is when uh, when you do. Uh, there's always this question about when somebody comes into the library, what's your role as a librarian? What's the role of the patron? But I think as a librarian, I'll speak for myself. I know there are others on this call who are collectors and who are philatelists. I have a small collection, but nothing's of great significance. But I, I think what I see our role as is when somebody comes into the library, I may not know all the specifics about what you're collecting or what you're researching, but I, I see my role as sort of facilitating where to find that information. And so it's a lot of the old adage of uh, knowing a lot of little things about a lot of things and sort of a little bit of information to sort of provide you an avenue to sort of begin your research. Um, and Nicola, Nicola sort of mentioned this earlier and I think Basile did as well, just sort of as a librarian, I don't sort of, I'm not there to sort of do the research for you. I think we're there to sort of really guide you in the right direction and then you take it from there. We're certainly there to sort of help you along the way if there are sort of roadblocks or sort of dead ends, but uh, that's that's how I see our role. I, I would add that it doesn't make any difference whether you're working at a, a baseball library in upstate New York, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, or um, a large library in London, England. Every library does the same thing. You, uh, and it's four categories. After identifying who your patrons are, the first thing is you collect. You, you acquire and obtain materials that are needed to fulfill that role. The second thing is you have to organize that material so you can find it when you need it. The third thing is you have to take care of it. You have to preserve it and maintain it. So putting it in the right environment, putting it on the right type of shelf and the right type of box, whatever, that's the third category. The fourth is you present it. And that is how do you take what you've collected and make it available to your patrons, whether it's putting it on a table so they can come in and use it at your library or digitizing it and loading it on the internet. All of that comes under that category, but every library on the planet does those four things. And uh, I used to get letters from people all the time saying, hey, I've memorized the baseball encyclopedia. I know every statistic in the game's history. And my response was, why did you do that? Um, you know, why, why? Uh, you know, we have the baseball encyclopedia on our desk, we can just look it up. Uh, and I think that was our motto is we don't memorize anything, but we know where to look it up. So, um, and I think you'll find that of true at just about every library as well. And, and I would say that that is the challenge for all librarians that, that there is so much information that what we specialize in is the ability to connect people to the information that they're looking for and to kind of reduce the noise that's in, as part of that. And, you know, yes, you can go Google something, but it's, it's good luck with that. Um, but if you talk to somebody who's specialized with the specialized skills and who especially knows those collections, again, they spend a lot of time curating and, and knowing those collections in a way that it's hard to do if you're just kind of passing the, not working with them on a daily basis. And I think that's the real benefit librarians bring to collections and to users of those collections. So moving on, and I'd like to, Charlene Blair is on and she says, collect, organize, categorize, present, present. So hi, Charlene, big shout out to you. Uh, let's talk about the role of the patron. Um, I, I know that when we were gearing up for this panel, that was, that was kind of a, you know, a heavy topic. So how about we, uh, how about we explore that a little bit? I think as, um, as Deborah said in, in her presentation, that the more the more a user can prepare for their visit, the more they're going to get out of it. I mean, personally speaking, you know, I, I'm happy if someone does turn up on um, on the spot and I'll do my very best to, to help them as all my colleagues, but there's going to be the chance that something's not available or, you know, they're... It, you know, it's out on loan or it's out being conserved or something. Whereas, you know, if you can contact us beforehand, you know, we can have it ready. We can have it there waiting for you. You can, um, you know, maximize, you know, your time. We can have, you know, a think about other things that you, you know, you might 
not know we've got or you might uh, want to look at you know quite often people um will go to Richard or will come to me or say well we haven't got it but they have vice versa and then you know they know what to do with their trip that they can you know do a bit with us a bit there um so yeah I think preparation is is key I think there's a lot you can do to, to maximise your the value of your visit. I think that um, I would recommend that patrons will should look at the web pages that we set up, check out our learning resources, and there's a lot of basic kind of housekeeping things that you should do individually. Like I say, if you do turn up unannounced, fine, we'll do what we can to help. But with time constraints, resource constraints, you won't necessarily get the best out of us if you don't put the best prep, prepare as best you can as well. It's, it's an iterative two-way process. I think, the, I think the other thing for me as well, sorry, uh, I think the other thing for me is, is sort of having a good idea of what you're asking. Sometimes you can come in with a very general, what do you have on this particular stamp or what this particular printer? And we can certainly help you with that, but that sort of makes the search that much broader. And really what we try to do or what I try to tell the staff here to do, and I've done this in my career, is that I try to narrow you down, try to get you down to, a, okay, here's specifically what you wanted to know, how many quantity or how many quantities were printed of this particular stamp or what, what are the varieties or something like that. So always think about that. You're the person, a lot of times I tell our patrons when they come in, you're in many ways the specialist. I'm the one to sort of facilitate you finding more information, but you're really the specialist. You'll know the subject terms I can search for in our catalog. So if you contact me by email or phone, uh, I try to sort of keep person, you know, going back and forth in a running conversation to sort of try and pick up some of the terms I can use to sort of help search for that material. Yeah, and I think dealing with patron expectations um, they have to understand that not everything has been digitized. Uh, the internet's a wonderful tool, but uh, there have been published materials around long before the internet existed and nobody has had uh, time to digitize it all. And in some cases, it's a violation of copyright to digitize it. So you might just have to sit down in the library and use a book. One of the things that strikes me as well with patrons, one, one of the most difficult roles in the job, Earlier on, Jim categorized the kind of core processes that we do. I've always personally found the hardest one is engaging, identifying our widest possible audiences and engaging with them. It's incredibly challenging. And, you know, you see with Deborah's collection, you see with Jim's collection, um, you know, you'll often find any archive or library will almost certainly have something of philatelic or postal history significance and likewise the, the whole the specialist holdings we have often like Nicholas says have much wider academic application social application and it's often quite challenging to kind of create metadata and search um, uh, you know identifiers that enable that and make that very effective Well, that, and that is where metadata comes in. That's where it's most useful is, <clears throat> excuse me, sort of helping with uh, finding that material. If, the, if there's solid metadata, it's very detailed, it's very organized. It allows not only the, the searcher, but the librarian to sort of find that material, the specific material that that person's looking for. Since we're talking about metadata, I mean, do, do we feel that we covered how to prepare for your visit adequately before we move on? I'd say don't, don't be afraid to get in touch. Um, that I have people who will say, oh, I'm really sorry, I keep emailing you. Um, we'd rather that, we'd rather you got in touch and we can, you know, go backwards and forwards and get exactly what you're looking for and work that out um you know it, it doesn't matter you know how you know how long that takes you know we'd rather we'd rather get it right and you get the most out of out of the resources that we've got yeah patrons need to understand that um you know we're not collecting stuff so it gathers dust in the basement <laughs> we want it to be used um i had a, a professor in library school who once told me that the best prep job you could get for becoming a librarian is to work as a bartender one summer. 
and learn how to, to deal with people and talk to people and listen to people because those are the most important skills you're going to have when dealing with the public. Good advice. We, we have some comments coming in. I think it's important as a patron to inform the library staff on the results of the research that might contribute to the staff's ability to inform future patrons on the research area. While the staff does not necessarily have to be educated on the subject, they can use the research results to enhance future patron experience. Yeah, nodding from the entire yeah. panel. And I would say that, that in my experience, just in working with some of my colleagues, they want that feedback. They are interested in knowing how you're using the collection and what you found that they didn't capture that, that maybe they need to know about and incorporate in future finding aids or, I mean, they, they really want that feedback. Yeah, we've, started, we've started collecting a little bit of that information too. If we hear back from someone doing a little follow-up as to did that sort of satisfy your research request? And is there something more we could have done just to sort of see if it, that's something we have within our, our resources or if we can sort of direct you in another direction to another library or repository? I find it very rewarding to see the end result of our work. You know, it's fun to engage with our patrons. It's brilliant to see their end result, but also that feeds back into the core activities again of identifying how our collection is being used, how best to allocate resource to improve accessibility and, and service delivery. So, so it very much is a two-way iterative process that, that um, is cyclical almost, um, symbiotic. One of our uh, audience members from YouTube is asking whether uh, the quality of the patron matters to librarian, meaning you know whether they're highly specialized or academically. Okay, I'm seeing nods to the negative. Okay, pretty cool. All patrons are created equal. Um, doesn't matter what your background is, especially from the British Library's perspective, we're paid for by the taxpayers. We're there to serve everyone. Uh, not just nationally, but internationally, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the scale or level of your research is an irrelevancy to me, as long as, as you, you know, we give the best service we can to you. And for me, I'm here to help the patron. We're an academic library, a special library, and a government library all under one roof. If I don't have what you want, I'll do my best to find it for you. You can borrow our books through your local library. And since philately covers a lot of subjects, we can find just about any type of book in our library, from science to art to languages to reference books. Our library is open stacks, meaning there's no barrier to the bookshelves. And finally, the library is a third place. The library is where you truly belong. A third place is a neutral ground. It's a new level playing field, lots of conversation, easy access, and a place where you feel welcome. It's low profile, stress-free, and it's your home away from home. The Postal Museum Library. Yeah, I mean, I think, um... All those who've been to library school would, uh, you know, that's very much the ethos of, you know, what is what we all believe in, that it is for everybody and, and whatever you, you want from the library, then, yeah, you're welcome. Isn't that lovely? What a great sentiment. And that's why libraries are just fantastic and always have a really warm spot in my heart. Thank you. What's the strangest, funniest patron query you've ever had with? <laughs> you want to go, you want to go, Nicola? Um, no, <laughs> it's not feel the time. I mean, I, when I worked with in a public reference library, I used to get a lot of, well, I, someone rang up asking if I knew how to roast a chicken, um, <laughs> which <laughs> my friends will tell you, absolutely not. And um, one chap rang up and he'd seen a, a, a pipe and he didn't know what it was. And he said, well, could you drive out and have a look? Um, you know, because I'd looked at all the maps and, you know, we sort of thought we knew what it was. He said, well, how about going out and take it, taking a look? So, no, it's not really, <laughs> you know, my job to go out and do uh, field work. But, yeah, you, you know, you do get, you get a lot of characters. Um, but no, nothing too strange, I wouldn't say. Well, I, it's not a philatetic story. 
But when I was a graduate student at the University of North Carolina, I was working one weekend in the library and this gentleman walked up and hit the desk and said, where's the head? And I'm like, well, the head of the library is not here on the weekend and I'll be glad to take a message for you. And I did my whole spiel and I was so proud of myself. And he just laughed and he says, no, darling, I'm looking for the bathroom. And so that was, that was my fun library story. I think some of the funny, funniest ones, uh, I still get, we still get this occasionally where someone will call up or email and they'll say, well, the book's blue. Um, and you'll go, okay, so what's it about? Or we still get these, the odd time where somebody just has a page, they have a photocopy or a copy of a page and they wanna know where that's from. One of my, the, it was one of the very first uh, reference requests I took here when I first started here. And I was able to figure out the page and what journal it was in. I, I was able to figure out what journal it was in just by the TypeScript and sort of how the page is formatted and things like that. I don't think I ever found the actual article, but I was pretty excited that I actually found the journal that this, that this page was from. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say there's quite a few, you get quite a few like that. I mean, I, um, I had one once where someone said, um, well, I was listening to a radio show on Monday and the person who was on that, it was their brother, apparently, wrote a book. And I said, well, who was the person? I said, I can't remember. And you're like, what's the radio show? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, eventually, amongst the staff who were there, we, we did nail who it was, um, but it took quite a few questions. But yeah, the, the asking for a blue book isn't, uh, isn't unusual. Um, in Asian African studies of uh, my former department, I was in the region and once dealing with general inquiries and um, someone was uh, working on Coptic manuscripts that we have and, and proceeded to expand at length for, or try to um, enter a debate and ask, ask me what language I thought the ancient Egyptian gods spoke. Um, and obviously wasn't able to answer that, um, but it was quite a challenge working out ways that they might be able to conduct that kind of research. Um, it took quite a few few goes on the, on the database and scratching our head with colleagues and working it through. But that, that's one that I do remember. With regards to readers, um, I don't think we're at the watershed yet for some of the stuff I've seen in the public library. But yeah, it's very colourful at times. I'd, I'd say one um, that does have a serious point behind it. Um, when, when I did work it in the, the reference library, um, someone came in and said, I, I, you know, I'm looking for my family tree. And, you know, I said, oh, you know, you want help doing it? And they said, no, um, have you got it ready? And, and they said, well, that's not how it, how it is on the TV. You go in and they have it ready for you. And yeah, the expectation that because on shows like, um, you know, who do you think you are, where the person goes in, they've just met and then they say, oh yeah, well, this is what we found for you. And this, um, this customer did genuinely believe that I was gonna go into the back and say, yes, here it is. Um, so yeah, I think, um, expectations about the you know the amount of work that does go into um, finding um, finding the resources sometimes. Yeah, related to yeah. genealogy, um, we have a lot yeah. of game used equipment in the museum collection, and we had um, a person come in once asking to see all the game used equipment from a, a famous ball player because they wanted to try to get scrapings of DNA off of it so that they could prove that they were the illegitimate son of this ball player. And it was like, no, we, we, we don't do that. Um, you're you're going to have to find another way to, to make that proof. But you, you never know what the next question is going to be. I had a phone call from a lawyer once who was working on a forgery case. So I helped him research the case and do the um, research. Not five minutes later, another lawyer called who's the opposition lawyer working on the same case. <laughs> so I helped him too. I don't know who won the lawsuit, but I helped both of them. I remember it Delivering an excellent local. customer service, Basil. Excellent. I, I remember in um, Islington Local History Center once, I had a, a researcher come in. They were buying a property in Islington, in Barnsbury. 
and um, they wanted to know why the, the value of the property was so low. So I said to them, well, you know, let's have a look at the local history collection, see what we could find. And I remember it transpired there was a, a, a double murder in the house. Hence it was um, hence it was at low value. And I think our research actually um, put the put the potential buyer off of purchasing the property in the end. Uh, that that was a very unusual one, and and like Nicola was saying earlier with the TV shows, uh, feeding on to what she was saying. I mean, I, I did a bit of research for a couple of episodes of Who Do You Think You Are, and I, I can reassure you, the stuff isn't um, ready made to go. It takes a lot of research behind the scenes to to get to that point, and, and often you'll find with some of the ones with overseas relatives, they'll travel off to India. And of course, they don't need to do that because everything's in London. So they'll often just dramatise it with these kind of overseas trips that don't really reflect the realities of genealogical research at all. So as we're coming down the end, um, we weren't able to necessarily get to some of the things that we wanted to talk about, but it has been very chatty. Um, I definitely want to find out the answer to this person. Uh, is there a philatelic network or a, a philatelic library network? Okay. And where can they we find it? We have a, a philatelic librarian's roundtable. We haven't done it since uh, COVID hit, but uh, yeah, we do keep in touch with each other. Uh, all the people, most of the people on this call are part of that. Um, so we do try to keep in touch with each other, sort of think issues that are, uh, uh, on the on the horizon for each of our libraries and sort of things to look for going forward. Um, one of the comments uh, I once read about something on stamps.org about a philatelic library circle or philatelic library association. Is this still around, they ask? I don't know of one here. I don't know, is there one uh, elsewhere? I don't know. No? No. Okay. Uh, the libraries have a long history of reaching out to stamp enthusiasts. For example, in 1917, the Library of Congress mounted a permanent exhibition of 308 proofs of stamps issued by the U.S. up to 1902. The library's philatelic collections were later transferred to the Smithsonian and eventually became part of the Postal Museum's holdings. So. Um, and on that note, Basil, be ready. What services can the National Postal Museum Library uh, offer while it's closed, remains closed due to the pandemic? I can help you search our catalog, the Collection Search Center, and the online virtual archives. I help people locate materials that have been digitized and transcribed. And you can be a part of the Smithsonian from home by participating in our transcription center at transcription.si.edu. We're taking volunteers. The transcription center wants to engage the public and making our collections more accessible. We're working with digital volunteers to transcribe historic documents to facilitate research. The Transcription Center is a website connecting volunteers around the world with our collections. This crowdsourcing project was developed as a way to increase access and use of our digitized content. And project number 6676 is the Postal Museum Library's transcription of the John K. Tiffany Philatelic Index. Also from home, I'm supported by an interlibrary loan department and I have staff access to a variety of information databases so I can access articles for you. I'm also tied into a network of expert curators who provide advice. I'm tied into a network of professional librarians here who have 2 million volumes in their collections. I can help you access accurate information online. For instance, someone recently sent me philatelic information they found online and I helped determine if it was true or not. I also help you cite your resources. I provide library instruction and I can advise on the research techniques our staff has been teleworking from home, so we're available on email to respond to your questions. We encourage you to explore and discover our virtual collections, library research collections, and many archival collections are available online through the Virtual Archives, Research Tools, and Collections Search Center. Are you sure you're closed? <laughs> <laughs> doesn't wow. feel like it. Doesn't feel like it. <laughs> no, it doesn't at all. Well, uh, we, we've come to the, uh, we've come, we blew through 90 minutes and I, I would like to say thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, what a great way to celebrate National Library Week. Um, I, as I say, our outro, please uh, panelists have a look at the chat. 
um, and taken your accolades. We had a really great turnout, both on YouTube and Facebook and here on the webinar. So thank you. Clearly, this is a, a topic that a lot of philatelists are interested in. Um, so everyone, please join me in thanking our panelists for uh, coming out today from all over the world. What a great presentation. We've had Nicola Davis of the Royal Philatelic Society of London, Jim Gates from the National Baseball Hall of Fame, Dr. Deborah Lee from Mississippi State, Dr. Richard Morrill from, British Lib from the British Library, Scott Tiffany from the American Philatelic Research Library, and Basil Wilder from the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives in Washington, DC. Stamp Chat is a production of the American Philatelic Society with memberships starting at just $25. You can join 135 years of international fellowship in the hobby and start taking advantage of member benefits now. Whether you're researching, shopping on Stamp Store or renewing your membership, it's stamps.org. Thanks for joining us. You'll find this and lots more Stamp Chats on the APS YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, and use the comment box to keep the conversation going. Until our next Stamp Chat, connect, collect with, connect and collect with APS. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, on stamps.org, the American Philatelic Society, social since 1886. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us, and happy National Library Week. We'll see you next time. Thank you.